The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. I recall just a blink of an eye him coming over into my lane. A head-on crash. It sounded like a bomb going off, the, the airbags going off. His body went to the ICU. My heart had stopped. His soul went somewhere else. There was a black void. What he saw from beyond the grave. Demons. And I started hearing growling and, and, and laughter. And how he came back to life. But she gave me that motherly stare. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks. Did any of you watch Westerns? I've watched a lot of Westerns. High Noon, Great Western, a classic. Uh, well, Gunsmoke, a classic. Uh, you know, on and on. Chuck Connors, or Wed, The Rifleman, a Western, all these classics. In every case, in every case, it's the sheriff, the lawman, who keeps the bad guys away from the honest citizens. And the honest citizens are almost always afraid to stand up against the gunmen who come in to uh, vandalize their towns. It's a classic. I mean, it's a, you write the script. I mean, it's there for every one of those shows. The lawman is standing against evil. And yet the left in America says, let's do away with the police. Are you kidding? How would you like it, folks, if your house got vandalized, if the women were not able to walk down the street safely? How would you like it if your property was taken away from you? You know, they talk about uh, while you're sleeping, strong men are standing guard. Thank goodness they're there. But the left says, oh, no, no, we want to defund the police. Can you believe that? Well, what does the left want to do? They wanted to have us... A nation where everybody is armed. They want to do away with the Second Amendment, though. They don't like that either. So what is the consequence of this drastic action? Gary Lane has more. In Minneapolis, members of the city council gathered with a group of peaceful protesters in Powderhorn Park, where they promised to bring change to the toxic relationship with police in their city. And we're going to create a fear-free future where every life is truly protected and respected. Nine members of the Minneapolis City Council have vowed to defund the city's police department. They say years of racism and mistreatment of minorities, culminating in the suffocation death of George Floyd, have led to this moment. And it's not only happening in Minneapolis. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio is proposing police reform, shifting funds away from the NYPD. I want to make a statement of principle right now that we will be moving funding from the NYPD to youth initiatives and social services. No Appearing on CNN's State of the Union Sunday, Housing and Urban Development Secretary somebody. Ben Carson Let's opposes the nationwide sure movement to defund police. Through. Think about the consequences. You want to abolish police departments? Are you kidding me? What happens if you do that? Everybody goes out and arms themselves. They start hiring vigilante groups to protect them. We have total chaos going on. <coughs> you know, that makes absolutely no sense. The founder of the Black Lives Matter movement says defunding police means shifting priorities and limiting the size, scope, and scale of policing because millions of Americans are concerned about not having the resources to live well. Why can't we start to look at how it is that we reorganize our priorities so that people don't have to be in the streets protesting during a national pandemic? Appearing on the Kojo Nemdi show, Washington, D.C. Police Chief Peter Newsham cautioned lawmakers to be careful moving forward. The number one thing that contributes to excessive force in any police agency is when you underfund it. Uh, if you underfund a police agency that impacts training, that impacts hiring, that impacts your ability to develop good leaders, uh, thoughtful leaders, Democrats in the House are proposing new legislation which would make it easier to prosecute police accused of violating civil rights. Critics say it is aggressively anti-police, and it is certain to receive resistance from Republicans and police groups. Around the country, violent protests are lessening, and even the National Guard is leaving Washington, D.C., where protesters on Sunday turn to prayer, seeking God to provide justice and calm to a nation in need of peace. 
Similar scenes in other parts of the nation. In Cary, North Carolina, some police officers taking a knee and reportedly washing the feet of community leaders in a sign of humility and service. In Norfolk, Virginia, more than 50 area churches held a peaceful prayer march throughout downtown. In Houston, George Floyd's hometown, a six-hour viewing is open to the public. A private funeral and burial will be held Tuesday. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, it seems like to me what they needed to do is fire the police chief in Minneapolis who hired a man who was uh, clearly unsuitable for police duty. He had a number of violations. He shouldn't have been on the force. Uh, they need to have police training. We need to have careful training. And also, the police are often from a, a, a pretty low segment of society because they don't get enough pay. So it's not a, a desirable job. They put their, their lives on their line to go out to defend people, and yet they don't get paid much in order to do that. We need to pay them competently. We need to have serious training psychological training, weapons training, uh, other trainings in, in uh, the law, what the Constitution has to say. And uh, we're going to be talking in another uh, couple of days about a nation of criminals. Do you know, folks, there are 300,000 criminal laws in agencies in across America, 300,000. And we're going to be talking about the fact that we have more people locked up in America than any other nation on the face of the earth. And that includes Red China, that includes Communist Russia. And yet we in America have more people incarcerated, a nation of criminals because of all these laws. And we're gonna be talking about how important it is. So the police are really going after certain criminals. And I, I was on a commission a few years ago, and we understood in the case of Washington, D.C., there are about 500 people who are hardcore criminals. If they got arrested and put away, the incidence of crime would have gone by down dramatically. But we cannot have police brutality. We cannot allow this. But why? Why do you have it? Well, it's because the police aren't trained, and they're not paid adequately, and, and they, they need resources, and the temptation, of course, somebody uh, wants to give them some extra money, and the extra money means they turn a blind eye to certain offenses. We don't want that either. You can't have corruption. But if you don't pay them adequately, uh, they've got to live. And so they need adequate pay. Then they need adequate training. And then especially they need training in the civil rights of human beings so they don't violate them. And one thing you don't do is hire psychopaths or people who uh, have got uh, a number of uh, offenses on their record and you put, keep them on the force. If that one man in Minneapolis had been taken off the force, we might not be having the terrible, terrible tragedy we're having. Well, we shift gears a little bit right now. In other news, New York City is going back to work as the lockdown begins to lift. And new research shows that without the stay-at-home orders, Billions more Americans might have caught the COVID virus. Ephraim Graham has that. Pat, a new study shows stay-at-home orders prevented 60 million cases of the coronavirus in America. Today, the epicenter of the pandemic is starting to reopen. New York City beginning phase one. Hundreds of thousands of workers are returning to their jobs. The public transit system is ready with social distancing guidelines in place and hand sanitizers and masks available. The buses and trains will be sanitized at night. Across the city Sunday night, landmarks displayed blue and gold to honor New Yorkers who stayed inside for months. More than 30,000 people in the state have died from the coronavirus. A mistake in the May jobs report means there's likely more people out of work than earlier announced. Friday, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported unemployment fell to 13.3 percent. Now the Bureau says the number of unemployed is actually higher, about 16.3 percent. However, that is still an improvement over April's numbers. The Bureau says the error was not the result of interference from the Trump administration. A former economist for the President Obama campaign said that you can 100 percent discount that possibility. American oil companies are priming their pumps. Many closed after oil prices took a steep drop in April. 
Now with oil at nearly $40 a barrel, some are ready to start producing again. However, the oil market remains unstable. OPEC, Russia and allies agreed to extend through July a production cut of 10 million barrels a day to keep from flooding the market with cheap oil, which could lead to an economic meltdown. Senator Lindsey Graham aims to call more witnesses in his probe of the Russia investigation this week. The Senate Judiciary Committee is looking into how the FBI made multiple mistakes leading up to the Mueller investigation. CBN News' national security correspondent Eric Phillips has more. Tense moments for headline witness former Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. He tried to explain that while he is accountable for mistakes made in the infamous Operation Crossfire Hurricane, he should not be to blame for them. But we spoke to one expert who begs to differ. Every application that I approved appeared to be justified based on the facts it alleged. And the FBI was supposed to be following protocols to ensure that every fact was verified. The former deputy attorney general took a lot of heat from members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. That's because Rosenstein approved so-called FISA warrant applications that ultimately led to the investigation of Russian involvement in the 2016 presidential election and any link to the Trump campaign. An inspector general's report found several application violations, including some with misinformation sent to judges who would approve those applications. This investigation, Crossfire Hurricane, was one of the most corrupt, biased, criminal investigations in the history of the FBI, and we would like to see something done about it. Who should we hold responsible? What, what do you want this committee to do? The other side wants us to do nothing. They don't want to talk about it. They're happy for these abuses to go on, apparently. What do you suggest that we do? I think, Senator, there, there are issues of accountability and blame. I'm accountable. I'm here being chastised by you, and that's part of my accountability. But the question is blame. What went wrong? Adding fuel to the fire, this recently released FBI document that started the whole investigation. Notice that it's from controversial FBI agent Peter Strzok to Peter Strzok, approved by Peter Strzok. Experts say it was poorly constructed and did not make a case. Democrats contend, however, that the IG's report indicated Operation Crossfire Hurricane was justified despite the errors and led to findings of Russian meddling. Congress should not conduct politically motivated investigations designed to attack or help any presidential candidate, Mr. Chairman, period. This would be true at any time, but even more so now, as our nation confronts the brutal police killing of George Floyd and its aftermath and remains in the middle of a public health and economic crisis. We're sitting here showing the American public that we argue with each other very well at a time that Rome is burning. Former assistant federal prosecutor John O'Connor told CBN's Gary Lane, America cannot let this ride. There was FISA abuse in the sense that we now know that the court was lied to multiple times in multiple ways. And everyone who is responsible and had any idea of the falsity, and that is to say the concealment, in the presentation should should be prosecuted. We have a whole battery of wrongdoing here, and it is sickening. It's more and more of a rat's nest every time we get a new disclosure. Committee Chairman Lindsey Graham says, here's the reason to continue probing. If you knew then what you know now, would you have signed the warrant application? No, I would not. Senator Lindsey Graham wants to subpoena more than 50 more potential witnesses. Democrats call that overkill, but say if it's going to happen, they want to call some witnesses of their own. Of course, this is all in addition to the criminal investigation into the origins of Operation Crossfire Hurricane being done by U.S. Attorney John Durham. Eric Phillips, CBN News. Thank you, Eric. More witnesses to come. Pat? You know, ladies and gentlemen, this country was racked by charges and countercharges. We had a federal prosecutor appointed by Rosenstein. He was a buddy of Rosenstein's. Rosenstein not only put him in office, but he extended his term beyond what had been given. The FISA warrants were based on fraudulent information. 
And yet before it was finished, we had a president who was indicted. We had a, a criminal trial of that indictment in the Senate. We had to look for weeks and weeks and weeks as the nation was occupied with that when we should have been occupied with much more important business. And all of this came to nothing because there was nothing there. And yet, because of Rosenstein and his buddies, all those FISA warrants were, were issued and they were on fr fraudulent grounds. And uh, the uh, prosecutor by, by Mueller, he found nothing, and yet they, they continued to to extend his term. And then uh, Rosenstein, it was said, he claimed, and then he said, oh, no, I didn't do that, but that he was supposed to tape President Trump to show that he was unfit for office and could be uh, taken out of office on account of the 25th Amendment, showing he was incapable. And then Rosenstein said, no, I really didn't do that, but he bragged that he had. I mean, it's just a mess. And, you know, then, then we have the, the sitting attorney general who recused himself and left the whole mess in Rosenstein's hands. And then he in turn turned it over to Mueller. And then, I mean, we were locked in this thing for years. And the greatest nation on earth was torn apart. And then we find that Peter Strzok and, and, and his girlfriend were sending faxes back to one another and approving uh, activity that should not have been approved. And uh, here again at the heart of the FBI, something needs to be done. I am a great fan of the FBI. It was a wonderful organization. But the corruption that is being shown there, we must get to the heart of it. This isn't some kind of a witch hunt. It's got to be taken care of. Because if we don't deal with it now, we'll have to deal with it sometime in the future. And the so-called deep state and all those in the intelligence department who had worked under Obama uh, were out to get Trump. And it's just horrible what went on. So we don't need that anymore. Our country is faced with many, many problems. And we don't need to make any more problems. I, I commend Lindsey Graham. He's doing the right thing. And I say, go get him, Lindsey. I mean, we've got to do it. So don't hesitate. Don't listen to the voice of of caution that says, no, 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 we, we, we can't open this uh, festering sore. I think the best way to heal a festering sore is to open it and put some antiseptic on it, and that's what's got to be done. Ephraim? Pat, the tropical storm that hit the Gulf Coast Sunday is now headed north as a tropical depression. Cristobal came crashing ashore Sunday afternoon in Louisiana, leading to dangerous weather farther east sending waves crashing over Mississippi beaches, swamping parts of an island town in Alabama, and spawning a tornado in Florida. That was one of eight confirmed tornadoes hitting Florida this weekend. Okay, Penny, get inside. Get inside, girls. After causing so much damage throughout the South, now the storm is heading north and could possibly reach as far as Wisconsin. Christian apologist and theologian Timothy Keller says he has pancreatic cancer and is asking for prayer as he begins chemotherapy. The popular Christian author and pastor announced the news on Instagram and Twitter Sunday morning. Keller said three weeks ago he did not know he had cancer and the doctors found it through, quote, providential intervention. He said, God has been remarkably present with me through all the many tests, biopsies, and surgery of the past few weeks. In his post, he also shared four specific prayer points, including praying for more of God's presence and joy during this time. You certainly are getting our prayers. Pat? Our prayers would go for Tim Keller, terrific guy. Mm -hmm. Well, anyhow, we've got a miracle story coming up. A man actually went to hell. Usually, people who go to those hell experiences, it's so horrible they don't want to talk about it. This fellow does, and I think he'll find it fascinating. Terry? That's right. Coming up, like a bomb going off. That's the terrifying sound one man heard when his car was hit head on. But it wasn't only what he heard that horrified him. It was what he saw. So what was it, and why did it scare him to death? Up next, Zoom potlucks, just one of many inventive ways military chaplains are reaching out to troops and their families in a COVID world. More on that when we come back.
just imagine being deployed in the middle of a pandemic. It's twice as tough on America's servicemen and women and, of course, their families. So when the pressure gets to be too much, where do they turn for help? Our national security correspondent, Eric Phillips, has the answer. Major General Thomas Soljum tells me spiritual fitness is a major pillar of military readiness. And he says during this challenging time, the 2,800 chaplains in his department are working overtime. When you put on the uniform in service to your country, Eric, and you're asked to possibly lay down your life in rendering service to your country, we owe, we have a moral obligation to fulfill, uh, to care for the soul of that soldier. And, that and Major General Soljim tells me that obligation to the soldier is more important than ever right now. So you might have a death of a family member, for example, and you, you can't go to the funeral, um, or you have parents that are aged and shut in and you can't get there. Now we have seen a reporting from our chaplains out in the field that there's been a real increase in a number of different areas for soldiers uh, and their families reaching out to them for assistance, for spiritual uh, direction, guidance, um, and, and, not, and, and, uh, and for religious uh, care as well for those things. The same types of sacrifice civilians face coupled with the added responsibility of service. So as with any worship, worship is centered around the light of Christ. And so we very much intentionally are lighting this light of Christ. To meet the need, chaplains have increased the hosting of live services. It's really a new phenomenon, and I'm really pleased to see how our people have stepped up to embrace the virtual environment in order to really continue to help people to stay connected. And today's thought is on the importance of small things. It means chaplains of all faiths across all military branches, not just ministering to troops and their families, but to all who tune in. So it's really taught us, I think, to raise the quality of, of, our, of our speaking, of what we offer people in a worship service or setting. And they're getting creative, like with the drive-in Easter service at this installation in Japan, or this Navy virtual service in Pensacola, Florida. They've been even doing things like Zoom potlucks, right? So chapel groups or religious groups you know, doing virtual potlucks, just wanting to maintain fellowship because that's a very important connection. So I, I see it in, in all of the struggle that people are facing. It's a tremendous opportunity um, for people uh, to be touched in, a, in, a, in their lives spiritually that may, in many ways, uh, life as normal may not have produced. Soljum says another positive of this challenging time is those in his department learning of one another's faith in a deeper way. And he says no matter how many chaplains he has, there's always room for one more. Eric Phillips, CBN News. Well, it's a noble calling, and I appreciate, you know, the great story of the three chaplains that went down together. You know, they're one Protestant, one Catholic, and one Jewish. And they went down the ship together, and uh, it was a testimony. Well, what's next? Up America. next, his heart stopped beating, and he felt his soul leave his body. Where did this man go next? What did he see? And how did he come back to life? You don't want to miss this, so stay with us. Like a bomb exploding. That's how Jeff Coulter described the terrifying blast as his car being hit head on. But that blast was nothing compared to the hideous sights and sounds he witnessed as he lay dying. Where did Jeff go? And what did he see and hear? Take a look. I was very bitter and I got lost. Um, I was very angry at God. How could God take such a saint? And I was very angry at God, yes. Jeff Coulter prayed to accept Christ as a young boy. But when his mother passed away of cancer when Jeff was 22, his heart changed. 
I started getting involved with my work, first of all, as a young police officer. I, I subsequently started drinking to try and fill the void. Over the years, the bitterness and alcohol fed on each other. I remember one time, almost as uh, vividly hearing the voices you and I talking now, you can't serve two masters. And I remember my answer, then I, then I will not serve God. Jeff met and married Susie. For many years, he also battled depression. The alcohol contributed immensely so to my uh, chronic depression. I was a binge drinker. I used to keep a bottle of tequila in the, in the fridge. I would put it in the freezer so I wouldn't have to waste time with a shot glass. One time, I drank so much that I blacked out in the back of my house in my utility room. And when I woke up, I, I didn't know where I was in my own home. I was always fearful for Jeff's safety when he was drinking especially. I didn't want him to be in an accident, and I didn't want him to be somewhere where he was just passed out and not able to take care of himself. I never stopped praying for Jeff. I knew that he could be better than the alcoholism and the man that he was becoming. I knew he was better than that. On April 22, 2014, everything changed. That day, Jeff was on his way to his favorite fishing hole when he approached a blind hill. I recall just a blink of an eye, him coming over into my lane. The only thing I really had time to do was blink. Uh, he come across that line, it sounded like a bomb going off, the, the airbags going off, the, the impact, the, the, it, it honestly sounded like an explosion. I blacked out, I vaguely remember hearing the, the car uh, skidding. The car had hit Jeff head on. He was life flighted to a hospital in Cincinnati. While in ICU, he had several surgeries. After one operation, Jeff coded. He says he will never forget what he saw after that. I passed out in my wife's arms in the hospital. I began to see images of demons, and I started hearing growling and, and laughter. What I was told afterwards, my heart had stopped, half my heart had stopped, and my respiration was off the charts, and I was basically dying. And uh, my, I felt my soul leave my body, and I, I remember seeing darkness and, and, and also fog on the floor and on the ceilings. I went to a place where there was a black void, and I remember crying out to Jesus, Jesus, help me. Jeff then saw a vision of his mother. She got up right in my face. It was a younger version of my mother. And I remember her looking me right in the eye. And for whatever reason, she was washing her arm. Now that could have been them washing, moving my arm at the, I don't know. As from a, from a believer's standpoint, I believe that it was symbol, symbol, uh, symbolized washing and for me to get, clean up my act. But she gave me that motherly stare. And after that, I remember zooming back and I basically came back in the room. The next thing Jeff remembers is waking up in recovery. One of the first things I remember doing was uh, find, grabbing the TV remote and finding a preacher on TV. I wanted to hear somebody, I wanted to hear the Bible an immediate desire to repent of my sins. In the days and weeks that followed, Jeff rededicated his life to Christ. I immediately quit drinking, and uh, I quit cold turkey ever since. I started reading my Bible again, and I started praying again. I, I no longer blame God for my, my mother's death. I blame the cancer that took her life. I resolved my relationship and my bitterness by counseling and attending church. If it had not been for the elders and brothers and sisters at my church helping me through this, I would not have made it. God can definitely redeem. God can definitely save. And Jeff is actually proof of that. I'm just so proud of Jeff and the change that he's made because I knew that that was the guy that I wanted to be married to forever. And now he's that man again. Now retired from the police force, Jeff and his wife have developed JNS Ministries. They also plan to open Galilean Fishing Lodge, a 
facility that will minister to young people. He is just a prayer away. Never think that you are worthless. Never think that you are not good enough. If God can save a wretch like me, he can save anybody. As eternal beings, we're gonna have to live forever somewhere. I would encourage you to live forever in heaven. <laughs> Jesus told his disciples, don't fear the one who can kill your body, but fear him who having killed has the power to send you to hell. There is something to be afraid of, where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die. And Jesus made it sound horrible. And you know, folks, there is a hell. Make no mistake about it. Eternal separation from God. And Jeff, fortunately, had come to the Lord. He went away from God, and God gave him a second chance. But I can't guarantee you a second chance. Nobody has one. And when we die, what happens beyond that is, is either you're going to be with him in paradise. Jesus told the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. Or to others, he said, fear him who has the power after he, your body is killed to send your soul into hell where the fire isn't quenched and the worm doesn't die. And it's eternal torment forever. There's darkness and torture and demonic spirits. And hell was intended for the devil and his angels. No human being was intended to go to hell. God never created human beings to go to hell. But hell is eternal separation from God. And if nothing else, the terrible remorse of what you've missed would be enough to drive you absolutely insane over a period of thousands and thousands of years to think what you could have had. But it's going to be more than that. There are demons in hell. There are torture in hell. The fire doesn't quench. The worm doesn't die. And, you know, that's what it is. You, you, you have a choice while you're alive. You could either spend eternity with Jesus and enjoy and bliss in the house of your father, or you can spend it being tormented like the devil and his angels. Which would you choose? You remember some years ago, Joshua said, now you choose which you're going to serve. You're going to serve those gods in the old country where you used to live. Or you're gonna, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Are you going to serve God or not? You, you have to decide. You have a mind. You have to decide. To, don't say, I'll put it off until a more convenient time. That day might not come, and you might have that automobile accident today. A bolt of lightning could hit you today. The roof could fall in on you today. You could be struck down with a disease today. Not tomorrow, not then. So settle it now. And the good news is, if you come to the Lord, if you come to the Lord, he that hears my word and believes on him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Do you want it? I'm offering it to you right now. Don't risk hell. It isn't worth it. It isn't worth it. You say, well, just one more fling, one more drunk, one more, one more uh, uh, affair. Uh-uh, uh-uh. It isn't worth it. Don't jeopardize eternity. Bow your head if you want to know what I ask, what I, oh, I'm going to give you. Do it right now. Bow your head. Lord Jesus, pray with me. Lord Jesus, go ahead and do it. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, Lord. I don't want to go to hell. Jesus, I do not want to spend eternity in hell, but I want to be with you. And so now, Lord, 
I turn away from the sin of my life, and I confess that I have done things that are wrong. But Lord, right now, I believe that you died for my sin, and that you rose again, that I might live forever with you, with the Father, at the Father's house. So I turn away from sin, and I turn to you, and I say, Lord, come into my heart. Live your life in me, and I will live for you, and I will serve you all the rest of my days. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've heard my prayer. Thank you. And I want to pray for you. Lord, may the power of the Holy Spirit come upon this one who has prayed with me just then. Let the anointing come upon them. In Jesus' name, touch them and keep them in the center of your will from this moment on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, if you want, had prayed with me, I want to give you something. It's free. It's a wonderful thing. What do you do next? And you ask yourself, what do, you, what do I do next? Well, this tells you. It's, it's a little compact disc. You can put it on your CD player, and it'll tell you what to do next. It tells you what it means to be born again. It tells you what it means to have an exchange life. It tells you what to do in case you commit sin, and the Lord has got an answer for you. It's all here, but you don't need a book so much as you need to call and just tell somebody, look, I just prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord, and I have come into the presence of the Lord. 1-800-707-7000. Toll free, no, no money involved. 1-800-707-7000. The angels of heaven are rejoicing over one sinner that repents. 1-800-707-7000. Pick up the phone, call in right now. Okay, Terry? Well, still ahead, informative, entertaining, and always unpredictable. Your questions and Pat's honest answers. Marge wants to know, when we get to heaven, will everyone know the sinful things we did before we got saved? Can you guess the answer? Well, it's coming up. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. For the third time, Facebook has shut down a conservative social media group that opposes Drag Queen Story Hour. The group called 500 Mom Strong was started by Anna Bohawk of Spokane, Washington to fight the event at a local library. She told LifeSite News Facebook removed the page because it was considered, quote, transphobic and violated community standards. She believes Drag Queen Story Hour mocks femininity and says the group has no plans to slow down or to stop its activism. The night before International Children's Day, Superbook aired on television for the first time in Portugal. Broadcast on RTP2 National TV channel, children watch Gizmo, Joy, and Chris as they travel through time to join David in his quest to defeat the giant Goliath. The Portuguese program also featured area hosts playing games with children. One viewer shared how his family invited a girl to watch the broadcast and she heard the gospel for the very first time. I want to remind you, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com international. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Chandra and her family have nothing to eat at all, especially since the COVID-19 outbreak in Cambodia. Her dad's work has been completely shut down, so he spends his days fishing, but the catch is barely enough to keep the family from starving. Times have been tough for 12-year-old Chandra and her family, especially since the COVID outbreak in Cambodia. My dad could not find work. So we don't have a lot to eat. Someday, we didn't eat anything. Chandra's father, Fal, had worked in construction. Now, there are no jobs and no way to earn money for food. We were poor even before the COVID-19 outbreak. Some days, I made $5 doing construction. Then, the virus hit. Earlier this year, we met Chandra at an after-school program sponsored by CBN's Orphan's Promise. 
There, we provided Chandra and her sister hot meals five days a week until COVID forced that program to shut down too. Normally, the girls would eat lunch at the church, but now the church is closed, so we have to make do with what we have. Fal tries to catch a few fish at a pond near their house, but the fish are small and not very plentiful. Sometimes, when I can't find any fish, we don't have anything to eat. We have to ask the neighbor to help. Sometimes they help. Sometimes they can't. So Orphans Promise offered some help for Chandra and others in her community. Instead of group meals just for kids, we brought food boxes, sacks of rice, and other groceries so that everyone will have enough to eat for a month, and will continue to provide food every month until the crisis ends. I am so happy that you gave us this food. Now our children will not go hungry. Thank you so much. You know, COVID-19 has been a drain on all of us. I mean, life has definitely been interrupted, but can you imagine what this is like for people who were already so compromised economically before this ever hit? I mean, families around the world are having their children fed, many of them by projects like Orphan's Promise makes possible. They go to church, they go to their classes, and they eat there every day. When that stops, there is no provision. So having an opportunity because of your kindness and generosity to continue to feed these children and their families is just a great blessing. It's a blessing to them and it's a blessing to us to know that we can make that kind of difference. We want to say thank you. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you make that possible. If you're not a member of the 700 Club, you can touch the lives of people all around the world right now, as well as right here at home by joining the 700 Club. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. Member. So simple. Our phone line is toll free 1 800 700 7000. Just call now. Listen, when you do, we want to say thank you by sending you this. Do you need a miracle? Who doesn't? We want you to have this. It's filled with real life stories of God at work in the lives of people today. And it's our way of blessing you and saying thank you for caring about other people. So you call our toll free number now. We'll get this gift out to you right away. And we thank you in advance. Pat? Well, up next, we've got your email. Jazzy says, quote, what age will we be in heaven? Children, adults, or older? Well, we've got your questions and honest answers coming up. Well, folks, we want to cover our nation with prayer. More than 23,000 of you have already signed up to stand with us and commit to pray daily for our nation. If you haven't joined us, just go to cbn.com slash stand and pray or text pray to 717777. That's easy to remember. Stand and pray. Stand and okay. Pray. Important. Yeah. Time for some email. Let's also important. Yeah. Okay. These are your questions, and here come some honest answers. Pat Marge says, "When we get to heaven, will everyone know the sinful things we did before we got saved? I know God will know, but what about our family and friends and everyone else?" Oh, uh, the family and friends are not going to know the stuff you did. I mean, thank goodness we don't want anybody yeah. to know. <laughs> That's I mean, you know. The, the, there's something, the sea of God's forgiveness. And when, when we there are in heaven, it's going to be so much in the glory of God that all this stuff that went on in our previous life is going to be obliterated in the love of God. We won't even have to worry about it. So I, I don't think there's going to be a remembrance of it. God's not going to remember it, and He's not going to bring it to you. And there'll be no sorrow, no sadness, no tears in heaven. So all the stuff you've done wrong, it's under the blood of Jesus, and that's where you want to leave it, all right? Okay, Janice wants to know, what age will we be in heaven? Children, adults, older? What does the Scripture say about this? Well, uh, I don't know if the Scripture says anything about what we're going to be in heaven, but we, the Bible does say we'll be like Him because we'll see Him as He is. And Jesus was 33 when He ascended into heaven. so. That would be an ideal age, and so that means the older people would go back and the younger people would go forward. So if that's the ideal age and we'll be like him, then that's what it is. But I think we'll be like the angels, and I don't think that angels have 
They don't get married. And they don't have age. They, right. they, they, they're spirits, okay? Okay, this is a viewer who says, Hi, Pat. Who are the many that Jesus refers to in Matthew 7, 22 and 23? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did not pro or we did not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Who are the... I mean, that's, you know, like multitudes. You know, the, the joke we have here is multitudes are thronging into our studio. I mean, you know, have, <laughs> have 10 people, you know. I mean, multitudes means a whole lot of people, period. Um, I think what you're concerned about is if you're one of them, those that do the will of my Father in heaven, Jesus said, you didn't know, are you doing miracles? Uh, you know, are you prophesying? Uh, did you walk with me? Or are you doing the will of my Father in heaven? They are the ones that he said are going to be part of that kingdom. All right. This is Brittany who says, Pat, how many times will we be judged after death in regard to Jesus' return? Also, will we be reunited with our former earthly bodies when God has given us a new body in heaven? Uh, I don't think you want to carry this old body around. This body is subject to <laughs> <Nope>. death. <laughs> we use the term mortal, and what that means mort is death. You're subject to death. I don't want this body once I get rid of it. <laughs> it's it's a pretty, been a pretty good body over a number of years, but uh, the, these things get infirm. Uh, we're going to have a spiritual body in heaven. We will, you know, Paul said, I, I, I don't want to be unclothed, but clothed upon with the body I have. We'll be spirit, and there'll be a resurrection body. Uh, what was the other part of the? Uh, and when, uh, let's see, also, will we be reuni reunited with our former earthly bodies? When well, the, the answer is no. I mean, we're going to have a, our spirits will go to be with the Lord, and we'll have a resurrection body. Okay. Okay. The other question was, how many times will we be judged after death in regard to Jesus' return? Well, as I understand it, uh, of course, we'll pass from death into life if we believe in Him. But we will account for the things done in our body. I think there will be rewards. And, uh, you know, we said, you know, we we'll stand before the Bema or judgment seat of Christ to account for what we've done in our bodies. So I, I think that there will be rewards and possibly punishment. Mm -hmm. But uh, you will be uh, saved. You, you will not go before the great white throne of God. I mean, the judgment is over in terms of hell. All right. This is Ashley who says, Hi, Pat. I wonder why my church doesn't use some of the gifts of the Spirit the Bible mentions, like healing and prophecy. It even seems as if my church would disapprove of me listening to ministries that utilize these, but I'm intrigued and think we're missing out. Do you know why the difference exists? There was a man who wrote a book called The Descent of the Dove. And the, descent, the idea was that when the dove descended, it was just too disruptive. I mean, you've got a printed schedule, okay? And the printed schedule is you're supposed to sing a hymn, then you're supposed to have the Bible reading, and then you're supposed to have, um, you know, another hymn, and then you're supposed to do something, something, something. And if the Holy Spirit comes in, uh, it disrupts all that. So the church said, well, we, do, we just don't want that disruption anymore. But I tell you, it's a blessing to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And I think there, there are a few churches that are moving in the Holy Spirit, but uh, again, it's, it's one of those, those things that we ought to pray more for, that we ask more of God. Mm -hmm. Well, today's power minute is from Malachi. To you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in His wings.